Chicago, Chicago, that toddling town, toddling town, Chicago, Chicago, I'll show you around. The corner was our magic, our music, our politics. Fires raised as tribal dancers and war cries broke out of different quarters. Power to the people. Oh, what? In the safe side city of Greetings and welcome back to the Sunny Side. I'm Kasabez Makma. Ujai, I'm the Hez Menu. And w- welcome to episode 14 of the Chicago Sunny Side podcast. Today we're celebrating once again 25 years of the Earth Center and the Kebta mission in the West, and in particularly uh, where the mission started in the West in Chicago. Uh, so, for those of you who may not know, uh, Master Nava, he traveled in Europe, he traveled in the United States, uh, but uh, Chicago was the first place where he came to start the M-Tom, uh, MTOM School of Comedic Philosophy and Spirituality and began initiating students into the Comedic Mystery. So uh, we're happy to be celebrating that, uh, you know, in addition to the m Mystery School, he also founded here in Chicago on Costa Natural Healing, uh, where he began doing spiritual reading, health care, health consultations, as well as selling uh, traditional African herbs. So, um, as well as Firefly Productions. Yeah, and, and that may have even started a little bit before that with, yeah. the, with the publications he started in Iowa. But when he came to Chicago, it became the Firefly. And then uh, shortly after that, the Sunnyside newspaper started coming out. So this show is a throwback to those days in a sense. Uh, but with, of course, uh, video to be with the times, you know. Cause there, no well, one, it's a continuation. Yeah. It's just up staying, no read no staying up with the times. I hope that people do still read because Firefly <laughs> Productions is doing a lot online with articles, blogs that you can read. As Take it well. as a challenge, y'all. Any of y'all who don't read, just get with you know, get with the words, man. The written word is still powerful. No, reading is so important. Absolutely. You know, in whatever whatever uh, career you're in, whatever work you're doing, whatever your mission is, your purpose is in life. You reading and getting the perspective and expertise of others who have went before you and done it before you only only assists only helps. Mm-hmm. In this time, when everybody's you know forced to feel like they're in a rush and they don't have time for anything, um, you know it can be easy to think that you don't have time to read, you don't have time to kind of sharpen your axe, but. Mm. Uh, it's important that you do so but I wanted to come back on 25 years of celebration because this is 25 years in the West meaning or more specifically 25 years in the United States Mm -hmm. but I don't want to as Americans often do act like America is the only one that counts because the fact is wherever Master Naba traveled he took on initiates he took on students people saw the light, the wisdom he carried, and they wanted to learn from him. And as Casabes said, he actually traveled to Germany, traveled throughout Europe, and there he took on he took on initiates, he took on students that were following him and assisting him in building the mission and what he was doing. That even, you know, contributed to him being able to come to America. Mm. And I want to even give shout out to all of those individuals who contributed to his work in Germany, as well as the individuals who contributed to his work in America when he started in Iowa with the publications and even when he came to Chicago and added the Mtom School. Um, he was doing meetings in Iowa and you know have, would have people over to his house and start discussions and things like that, start really building and opening up their minds to some of the perspectives coming from from indigenous Kemet. But the school really got started and the structure of the temples 
Temple Education, Temple Initiation really got started in Chicago, and so that's really what we're celebrating with the 25-year mark. Yes. I mean, as we know, these traditions didn't start with Master Naba. This is something that's thousands of years old, tens of thousands, really. So it's not something that we can say, oh, everything started here. If it was, it wouldn't be so valuable. But it just happened to be that this is where uh, he came to kind of like start the, I mean, I would call it maybe like the cornerstone of what we're still building on in terms of like a, a, a structure that's built outside of the indigenous initiation camps. Like this is like where he really started to build that. I would say where the bridge was really completed. Uh -huh. Because in Germany, he was still building it. Mm -hmm. But in America, it really got um, materialized as a bridge to bring people from the West back to the to the traditions, back to into the initiations. And therefore, the structure was set up, you know, and all of that. Um, and that really was a big threshold in this mission yes. uh the other well, thing maybe the cornerstone of the bridge okay the but uh the <laughs> but i feel like you know when we got started it was like a bridge one of those rope bridges that you see in the jungle with the planks and stuff and like we've been you know over time trying to refine that so you know i'm proud to have been a part of it and uh i'm just happy that chicago for whatever reason happened to be the place that he came first because that's where I was. So, you know, I was just uh, thankful that I didn't have to be like this brother and uproot my life and <laughs> and move over here. But uh, that might even Yeah, there's some benefits. You, there's you some know? benefits yeah. to that because it cut down on the distractions. Mm -hmm. Which but, I definitely had. But um, the other thing I wanted to say about the Sunnyside podcast as a continuation of the Sunnyside media that already existed in print mm -hmm. for those Chicago landers that are listening that remember the Sunnyside, you know, we used to take it all around the city and bring that perspective coming from the Earth Center mission to Chicago, throughout Chicago. But the, Sh the Sunnyside podcast as now a video podcast, you know, radio outlet is also a continuation because when Master Naba left after getting things started in the West and then went back home to Burkina Faso, he started a radio show called The Light, mm -hmm. Lu uh, Lumiere. Mm -hmm. Don't, you know, Lumiere. don't get upset with my French yes. pronunciation. That's not why we're here. Right. <laughs> but he started that podcast, The Light, and you can see that's really the concept we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The Light making sure we can identify where that light is is uh, being held, being kept, and uh, people are benefiting from or have the opportunity to benefit from around the city. And then, of course, Kepta is a big bringer and carrier of light for people in Chicago, and we wanted to use this podcast to make sure that more and more people can understand that and learn that and we're celebrating the fact that that's been happening for 25 years now in the middle in the heart of babylon in the middle of the monster the belly where of the beast. so much has been done to make sure that any light that's really been kept this long the you know any torch that's been burning this long from deep deep within the human heritage is really extinguished i mean that's what we see america we're doing hijacking. all around the globe so um, we're happy to <clears throat> come back to an episode in this series. We did our first one with um, Tonton Olivier Kwame and the... Um, that was episode seven, right? I don't know. You better at numbers. I believe so. Me. And this is episode 14. Right? Oh, nice. Timer. Nice. Yes. Okay. We didn't even plan it like that. Mm -hmm. But maybe someone was planning it. Maybe. In the shadows and bringing it forth in the light, like the sunny side. Maybe we could have called ourselves the light if we didn't have a light FM here in Chicago. Well, I like the sunny side. Yeah, know. I do like it too. Um, the other thing that has been in the news recently is more news from back home, mm -hmm. back in Western Merita. Um, and I, I don't know if a lot of people in the West stay up on what's really happening there. You may hear about some of the recent coup d'etats. I know we've talked about it on the, on the podcast. Some of the recent coups that have been led by the militaries of uh, Burkina Mali, Faso. Burkina Faso, Niger, Guinea, Gabon. Gabon. But 
there's also a real serious issue of terrorism, of religious extremism, of foreign meddling in Western Merita. Mm. And even that hits very, I mean, it hits home for us in Kepta because even the Naba lands, the Naba temples, where Kepta ha is established from, you know, mm -hmm. where we really are anchored, the, the, the existing comedic temples that have preserved the spiritual power, the spiritual heritage of the Nile Valley. A lot of, I mean, the main ones have even been moved from their ancestral lands. The temples that the Earth Center usually takes pilgrims to every year for annual pilgrimage, we aren't, a, we aren't able to go there. And even the Naba family isn't able to stay there because of this violence, this terrorism that's happening there. Mm -hmm. So this is a big issue, not just in Burkina Faso, but around Niger, around Mali. And on a recent episode, we were talking about how they, those military uh, governments have, since the coup, formed an alliance to take responsibility for protecting themselves instead of allow, instead of depending on the UN or depending on foreign um, military efforts to come in and protect them in their own home. And so there's more news coming from there. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, if you've been following the Sunnyside podcast, I'm sure you've been aware of the situation. Um, these, uh, this alliance really was kind of, um, made necessary by the threats that um, the ECOWAS, the Eco Economic Community of West African States, uh, which is, you know, basically a political block. It's not just economic, but it's a political block of, uh, of countries in West Africa that's more or less um, led by colonial powers, like mostly France and probably Great Britain as well, to an extent. Well, let's be clear. It's the most prominent political block in West Africa. Mm. However, it says it in the title, it's ECOWAS. It's based on economics. Mm -hmm. And the economics of West African countries still rely and still depend on Europe to yeah. print their money, to, uh, to validate their money. You know, they all still pay taxes on getting that money printed. That money still kept in Europe. And so, Europe's concern in Africa is economic. They have no real interest in the well-being of the people. So the politics there is just for the sake of how they're going to extract the resources that they want up out of there. So, yeah, it's it's pretty well, you know, accurately stated, but how it transfers into other fields of people's lives may not always be as clear to us, you know, on this side of the world. But, uh, yeah, it's a very... Uh, I don't want to say very powerful, but it's probably the most in, influential international block of of countries there in that part of the world. And so they had been threatening when Niger, Niger was almost the most recent uh, country to have one of these military coups. And they were threatening to uh, militarily restore the ex-president to power because they didn't kill the ex-president. They just, you know, locked him in his house. So uh, they didn't, you know, they didn't need to kill anybody. They just took control of the country. But they're saying, oh, we need to restore democratic order, which once again, uh, the people of Niger were not calling for this, but people from outside Niger were calling for this for because they thought, hmm, if we let this happen here, maybe uh, they'll overthrow me next. So... <laughs> the Nigeria, you know, president and some of the other presidents were. I recall. Yeah, they're up in arms about it. But anyway, they, in addition, well, first of all, Burkina Faso and uh, Mali were like, okay, well, if you guys, um, if you guys invade Niger, we'll take it as an act of war against us. So you guys will be dragging us into a larger conflict. And I don't I know y'all don't want that. So they've been forming this alliance called the uh, alliance of uh, Sahelian states. states and uh, so the Sahel so probably people don't even know what the Sahel is so, you know the Sahara Desert largest desert in the world goes across North and West Africa to East Africa and um, 
just south of that is the Sahel region, which is kind of like a dry savanna climate. So uh, that that's uh, the states that are involved here. And that's really the area that's most affected by the terrorist activity as well. <coughs> so that really um, is important for us and our mission because a lot of people don't know what the Sahel is and there, and even more people don't understand mm -hmm. that before the current definition of the colonial countries in Africa, mm -hmm. even as that was getting started, already invaders were there and colonization had started. There was a strip that went throughout Africa, almost from the East Coast to the West Coast, right around that area in the Sahel and just south of the Sahel that was called English Sudan and French Sudan. The English Sudan is the Sudan that you now know as Sudan and that area. And then French Sudan was west of there, but extended all the way to into West Africa, almost to the coast. So what we now call Niger, what we now call Burkina Faso, what we now call Mali, I think even into Guinea, all of that is known as French Sudan. So really all of that are people that are related to each other, cultures that are shared, cultures that are related to each other. Mm -hmm. And to see these three groups now saying, standing up and saying, you know what, uh, we no longer want to be controlled and manipulated by outside forces. And what recently happened um, is that the three of them have exited countries. These three said, we no longer going to be a part of ECOWAS. We stepping out of that because whatever the original mission was, if the original mission was about protecting the countries of West Africa and strengthening us, the those original that original mission has been corrupted and been lost by whatever foreign powers or whatever uh, ambitions of those leading it have gotten involved and mm -hmm. and ruined that. I mean, assuming that it was ever for the people in the first place. Sure, but you know, when they give a when they give an official statement, they have right. to talk officially. Okay, yes. So they said, you know, since that's been compromised, it doesn't serve to help protect us. We're dealing with a real situation here. Mm -hmm. People are being kicked off of their land. People are being killed. I think, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, since the terrorism really started there, there's been thousands of deaths in the villages, in places where people don't have any military protection and ECOWAS isn't standing up to do it, but they make sure to stand up against military coup d'etats that are being done in with no deaths that in are order. being done with no deaths mm -hmm. mind you mm -hmm. in order to actually bring protection to the people in that country and it shows that they're, they're they're doing it for the protection of the life of their people because they don't even take the life of their enemies when they do it mm -hmm. it's like hey you guys are coming from this land too we're not here to kill you we're just here to put the power back in the hands of people that are actually intending on protecting the people and improving their quality of life because the power has been in the hands of people that just want to serve themselves and that's really a big i mean it's a big step and a big movement that's happening in our motherland right now that everybody should be aware of everybody should be behind even i see you know you look at the black communities around america we talked about this already. You see how many people are standing up for Palestine? That's great. The loss of life anywhere, you should stand against it, sure. But I don't really hear anybody standing up for what's happening in Merita right now, our homeland, where even you can trace your blood, your DNA mm -hmm. to, where people are standing up and saying, you know what? The actual people in power, in political power throughout Africa are oftentimes descendants of the people who benefited from the slave trade. That's how they got the money. That's how they got the riches. That's how they got the political power that they have now. There, there was recently, uh, there was recently an, an interview circulating around social media with Sean Kuti, the son of Fela Kuti, who's a musician. And he was saying one of the d dirty, hidden secrets about Africa is that the people in political power 
today are the people that inherited that power from benefiting from slavery. Their parents were the ones who got brought into slavery in the slave trade, and then they were the ones kind of benefiting from selling their people into the slave trade. Mm -hmm. Now you have military, uh, military groups standing up and saying, you know what, it's been with those people too long. Most of those families even don't even live in our places anymore. They moved to Europe and they just suck the, the wealth out of our place. They benefit from the mines in our place. We taking the power back, we kicking them out, we kicking out the, the foreign companies that control the mines, that control the resources, so that the wealth in Africa can go and benefit the people of Africa again. And that's a big movement that's happening right now. So I really want more and more people in the West to know because your ancestry is there. And now it's like the, the people connected to your ancestry standing up again and saying, hey, ho the homeland should be for the people of the homeland. The homeland shouldn't be just serving outside anymore. And then the people of the homeland, the ones suffering, the ones getting kicked off of their land, the ones getting murdered in the villages because nobody sees them as important enough to stand up for and protect. Now this uh, alliance of Sahelian states is saying, no, we're protecting our people again. So it's really good to see. It's good to see, and it's good to see them, you know, just saying, hey, we don't want anything to do with you people uh, in ECOWAS. Uh, just to give an example of um, what's happening, uh, ECOWAS has not only threatened the um, actual military invasion of uh, Niger, but they've also put sanctions. And uh, if you don't know, Niger is mostly desert uh, and Sahel, and then they, uh, they're they landlocked. There's no access to the coast. There's no access to the ports uh, and commerce. So, um, I mean, commerce from worldwide by sea, which is the main way that products move around. So um, now with this coup d'etat happening, they want to put sanctions. So that means that uh, the countries of Nigeria and Benin, which are like the closest ones uh, with borders to Niger, have put sanctions. They said we're not allowing goods to travel from our ports to Niger. Then uh, Togo then becomes like the next closest port country, which is just like a tiny, you know, kind of sliver of a country, but they have a big port in their capital of Lome. So in order to transport goods from the coast to Niger, they have to go through Burkina Faso from Togo. You know, they go through the whole Togo, probably takes about 20 hours just to get to the coast of, I mean, uh, the border with uh, Burkina. Then they have to go through Burkina where there's a terrorist problem. So when we, last time I was traveling from Togo to Burkina, I saw this huge line, this huge convoy of trucks. Mm -hmm. These brothers were just, you know, it's the middle of the day, uh, so it's hot. These brothers are like under the trucks, chilling on, on their mats, maybe eating lunch or whatever, because they know they're not going anywhere. I'm asking like, what's going on? It's like, they're waiting for a convoy to accompany them to uh, Niger. There's a lot of paperwork or whatever that Togo has to do and whatever to arrange things and then they have to go through Burkina and they might be there a month or two so they just waiting. So you know it's it's a long long line of trucks just waiting with goods that people need and it's being held up and because people want to make political moves and uh, do sanctions. Uh, again you know when people do sanctions like you always hear about it's people who end up suffering from not having the things that they need or the things they depend on. Mm. You know, hopefully, at least, you know, like we've seen in Cuba where the sanctions have been going on so long, they just know they need to depend on themselves. So that can even become a good thing. But when you just cut people off willy-nilly like that, uh, it's a horrible thing to do to people. You're you know? playing with people's lives. Exactly. Yeah, but that's the thing, is that today our lives are being played with by politics, we all know it. Everywhere and well, every, it's been happening for a few thousand Everywhere years, and believe. every continent, we know that our lives are uh, under the foot of politics. Mm -hmm. So to see, uh, even though you see it happening on the political stage, at least to see some people standing up for the people again and saying, you know, we no longer want whatever, however politics is 
is being executed in this country to continue just sucking the blood from our people. We, we, we want to change that. You know, it's a good thing to see. However, we we tend to see that when that happens just on the political stage, it, it fizzles out. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we bring that up because that's really the homeland, the home villages, the home temples of the Kepta mission. And the Kepta uh, mission and the Earth Center as an organization being the outreach arm and an example of that revolution happening at a deeper level, on the spiritual level, on the cultural level, to bring the cultural heritage of that homeland back to its descendants and even to fortify it in the people that are there because we have we have temples on the uh, in the homeland in Burkina Faso in Togo we work with temples in that area to have it happening on that side too together and then see this political side follow it is exciting to see so we wanted to bring that up um, and then you know, long life and divine protection to those brothers and whoever supporting them to big ups also to Sean Kuti uh, and his father Fela who's another example of uh, you know what you can achieve through posterity and through your you know through your descendants because his his children are still carrying on what he's doing definitely and and divine protection as much as the as much as it will mean even coming from you know initiates of the temples we praying for divine protection for the naba family and for all of the elders and the priests who have been fighting who have been um preserving the heritage that really gives us our identity you know divine protection and and uh, divine protection for the naba family the naba priests that are right now under attack uh, and their homelands are under attack mm -hmm. So all of that to uh, introduce today our episode and our guest, who is our respected executive director in the Earth Center, carrying the Kepta mission into the West, mm -hmm. Nekitum Kamentu. So we're very happy to have him on the show, and we want to get to his interview. So I'm looking forward to hear what our brother has to say. So we are here with the executive director of Kepta, or the Earth Center. Uh, we are pleased to have you. Thank you for coming on and sharing your precious time with us. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Um, can you, for our listeners and our viewers, introduce yourself, where you come from? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is uh, Nekita Kamentu. I was uh, born in New Jersey. Uh, I grew up here in America. Uh, for the last 17 years, been traveling back and forth uh, between here and Burkina Faso and Togo getting initiated by the Mutam Temples. And uh, currently I'm the executive director of Kepta, which is our nonprofit arm uh, here in uh, the West. And we are ecstatic to have you on because this year, year 423 of the Kemetic calendar, is the 25th year of Kepta's uh, work here in Chicago and so this is part of our series in celebrating 25 years of the mission here in Chicago and being that Chicago was really the first place Kepta was established is 25 years in the West um, and we were hoping to have you on to speak a little bit about how the last 25 years have looked um, we spoke not too long ago with the late um, Olivier Kwame, mm -hmm. uh, member of Kepra. Mm -hmm. um, I know you were there with me in Merita for the New Year celebration. We got to spend some of his last days here among the living with mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. it, that was a, a, a privilege blessing. and an obligation. I mean, a privilege and a blessing. Um, but can you say a little bit about how you came into the mission, where the mission was at that time? Um, you know where and then how you've seen it transform yourself and yeah sure I mean if I'm to cover the last 25 years obviously I'm eight years late I came 17 years ago right you know but uh, nonetheless uh, you know when I found it um, there were a number of factors pushing me in in that direction you mm -hmm. know internally externally you know mm -hmm. and uh, when I began it I when I began my classes at Mutam School in 2006, 
I soon became profoundly aware that this was something that was unparalleled and I've never seen anything like it. Well, not to cut you, not yeah, to cut you, yeah. but when you say there were a lot of factors, internal and external, that even motivated you to look for something like this, sure. can you expound on that? Because really a lot, a large part of the show is really speaking to people that maybe have some of those factors, motivating them to look for solutions to some of the problems that they're facing. So a lot of them might be able to um, relate. relate. Well, I mean, sure. Uh, a lot of it was, I'm not going to say intangible, but it was just things nudging me and pushing me in that direction. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I always had an interest. I mean, I grew up in New Jersey, so I'm an American. Mm -hmm. You know, I have uh, a mixed ancestry uh, from the Mediterranean and some from Mexico and stuff like that. But, uh, if, you know, um, when I began uh, uh, kind of waking up as a young teenager, I was always aware of the fact that indigenous culture was more intelligent than modern culture. Mm. I just knew that. Mm. That was just a basic thing because mm. it's like, wait, this doesn't make sense. This makes sense. Mm -hmm. More experience, less experience, so on and so forth. So, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't as though I didn't experiment and check out other areas on Earth besides Meditown mm -hmm. or Africa, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's the, kind, the common gamut that people go through, such as, you know, India, China, maybe Native American. Mm -hmm. uh, but Africa's like, you know, not touched because right. typically it's demonized, you know? Mm -hmm. They did a good job as the church of demonizing Africa, mm -hmm. whereas mm -hmm. Anything traditionally African is, by most major religions, seen as uh, uh, from unholy. The dark you know? continent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the dark continent. It, you know, it's evil. It scares people. You know, the fact that you know, the capability in nature to manipulate things. You know, mm -hmm. exists, mm -hmm. and there's people that actually know how to do that. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. that terrifies people. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you know, I don't know how it's any less terrifying than someone's ability to manipulate a gun <laughs> or and load it up and, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know drop a bomb right. or send drones anywhere. But I remember, hey, I remember sitting in, a, <laughs> I, remember sitting in a, I think it was a Sunday school one day, and the guy said, <laughs> when I was young, and the man was saying, you know, and I even went to Africa, and you know, saw people transform into butterflies. I I never seen anything like that and that's just the devil. And I was like, into butterflies? <laughs> like what? <laughs> How can that be the devil? That sounds awesome. Yeah. Right. You saw that? Yeah. I mean it's just that the whole relative insanity of it when you look at the evil done existentially on this earth and mm -hmm. who's doing it mm -hmm. and their reasoning and their excuses. Then you look at indigenous practitioners right. mm -hmm. who deal with good and bad people all the time, just mm -hmm. like everyone else on earth do. Mm -hmm. And then you look at that level of demonization. You re it really makes you lose some confidence in mm -hmm. the human psyche mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and see the weakness of the, mm -hmm. how the human mind can be conditioned, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. anyway. So, you know, <laughs> I, you know, Africa was kind of low on the list because that was just what was available to me as a youth, you know, mm -hmm. like looking at indigenous culture. Mm -hmm. And, but things kept pushing me towards it, you mm -hmm. know, kept pushing me. I, I, somehow I got into drumming. I ended up going on a trip to Accra when I was about 17 or 18 with a friend of the family who told me I had to go. Mm -hmm. He was working uh, with the Black Studies Department at a university and knew my family. And okay. knew I drum too. He said, yeah, come, come. So that was my first exposure. You know? And that's, that's Accra in Ghana. Accra, yeah, in Ghana. We went Accra, Kumashi, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it was a good trip. Short, but profound. Um, profound because I actually met people on that trip that had a quality that was very refreshing. And I remember that as a youth. I'm like, because I just sat and talked, had conversations that were philosophically elevated. Mm -hmm that were genteel, meaning mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. you know, and meaning like civilized, you mm -hmm. know, or whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. And all of these things, and I was like, wow, man, these are really elevated people. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to the U.S. hanging out with all the stoners and the crazy people and the conservatives and the politicians. Like, God, I'm like, Africa was great, you mm -hmm. know. And then it was just kind of a footnote, you know. And I, it wasn't like I didn't have some interest in some of the things, but... 
all you have available is like these kind of uh, compendiums on voodoo and stuff like yeah. that, and all has like this kind of sheen of uh, like a dark yeah. kind of mm -hmm. sheen around it. You know? mm -hmm. Anyway, fast forward over the years, one thing led to another, and, and finally, uh, you know, I I I was. Um, I discovered that the Earth Center existed. Mm -hmm. I discovered that Kepta existed. And I said, wow, something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's what drew me to it. Mm -hmm. So I say all that just to say I had a history of seeking. Yeah. You know, I had job. I was holding down jobs and doing other stuff that whole time, family things. Of course, but of course. Underneath all that, I was conscious of these things, you know. And so when I found it uh, and then started uh, being initiated at Moontown School, I realized how profound it was because I'd never read or heard anything that was so practical, um, spiritual, yet not esoteric. Mm -hmm. All of these things, you know, they kind of rolled into one. Mm -hmm. Very existentially realistic, mm -hmm. yet dealing with all of the elements that spirituality is supposed to include, mm -hmm. you know, in a perfect world. Mm -hmm. but, so, so that, uh, when I started subjecting myself to initiation, because initiation isn't just learning information. Initiation is learning knowledge, applying it to yourself, really meditating on it, allowing it to enrich your life day to day, mm -hmm. and then it begins to alter you, mm -hmm. because it's very old knowledge. Mm -hmm. You learn things about, let's say, uh, human behavior, aspects and functions of the mind that were kind of distilled down to these very simple processes I didn't know about really, mm -hmm. or ever take the time to isolate like that. Mm -hmm. uh, things about the human spirit, lineages, ancestral realities, uh, relationship with the earth, all of these things, either energetic uh, realities, mental realities, psychological realities, all elements having to do with the human condition and then our placement on earth because it's human initiation you know it's mm -hmm. not like a tree initiation right, right. right. Mm -hmm. or alien initiation yes so how does this affect <laughs> the relationships that you had established prior to because initiation as we all know yeah, yeah. changes you in so many ways on so many levels yeah. what about the people that are around you yeah yeah well i was lucky let me, and that's a great segue because it has to do with what was perceivable in the changes in me yes. by people around me. Mm -hmm. I was lucky because I knew enough to be like, I'm not telling nobody I'm doing this mm -hmm. at the beginning. Like my family, I'm just going to kind of start and check it out because I always take things with a grain of salt. It's just the kind of person mm -hmm. I am. I don't know if I need to check it out to see if something's for real or if it's worth doing mm -hmm. or worth standing on. And I never subscribed to anything before, like a religion or anything remotely like that. I don't believe in belief. Mm -hmm. I think belief, faith, uh, all of these things are for the dogs. I don't believe in belief. Yeah. Be a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I just don't think it helps anybody. You can believe whatever you want. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You can have faith in whatever I want. You just set yourself up to be disappointed. Right. It just, eh. Mm -hmm. You know, I, so I, I don't really, I never subscribe to religion. I don't believe in belief. And then um, all of these things. And then so, you know, I'm, I'm always taking with a grain of salt when I get involved with it. So that automatically just activated my tendency to keep it quiet. Keep it quiet. Mm -hmm. You know, family and friends. Mm -hmm. After a while, I'm like, this is really amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, so then I kind of eked it in a little bit. I'm like, yeah, I'm taking some classes studying you know, indigenous things, you know, mm -hmm. from Africa, and it's very profound, you mm -hmm. know, it has to do with our, all of our common roots as, as human civilization, and mm -hmm. the connections are amazing, it's mm -hmm. profound, it penetrates all societies mm -hmm. on earth, you know, mm -hmm. I just, you know, little things there, without right. getting religious about it, and yeah. all this kind yeah. of stuff, dogmatic, yeah. dogmatic or anything like that, um, so, eventually, over the course of a couple of years, uh, uh, when I began to change, I began to become more stable, uh, just really go in a direction that my father appreciated, mm -hmm. very much so, mm -hmm. my mother appreciated, mm 
uh, uh, my family and friends saw mm -hmm. like this element that was more stable, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But like I was perfect, but I mean there was like progress, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, but and they were like, wow, you know, and and there began to be a respect there, and then I started bringing people around. So that mm -hmm. it was, and then you know we were all having dinner. You remember that from the early days coming to yes. family's house? It was like everything was like this. Mm -hmm. And, and I could see the appreciation by your parents too. Yeah, yeah. For you know what, a young group of people getting together for positive things, for trying to improve their life, enrich their life with the respect to old culture and indigenous values. Mm -hmm. You could see that. Right now, I, I was I I had that, if you want to call it luck, I would I don't know if you call it that, but I had that luck, right? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> um, mo a lot of people aren't like that though. A lot of people will learn, and they'll be like, oh my God, this right. is the truth, right. this is amazing, and they'll go and pose it on their family and friends, and then they just come off like any other religious zealot, mm -hmm. because there's nothing to substantiate it. Right, so it wasn't luck. It was, yeah. You know, maybe the a luck strategy. Of, you know, the yeah. luck of your strategy. Right, for sure. The luck of being strategic. But yeah, a lot of, just to go back to the original question, sure, a lot of, <laughs> I mean, my experience has been tremendous, you can imagine, in 17 years. Uh, it, it wasn't only the fundamentals I learned at the beginning of the initiation, uh, but my own experiences guide, guided and led through being able to be in the culture, to being, being back on the motherland, mm -hmm. and, uh, and having that exposure day to day uh, has helped me spiritually, helped me psychologically, has helped me mentally, existentially, like my identity. It's helped me also to transcend all kind of political poisons, mm -hmm. which the world is drowning in. Even people who think mm -hmm. they're freeing themselves from politics might even be caught in a rung of politics. Mm -hmm. That's like the great trap of the oppressor mm -hmm. is, to, is to divvy uh, prescribed battles to motivated people who want to free themselves, but those prescribed battles keep them like mm -hmm. just locked right under because the ceiling, you know? Even how we identify ourselves is through political mm -hmm. I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, how could you, that's the, that's the biggest trick is like when you galvanize your identity as a, as a defensive reaction to oppression, mm -hmm. that oppression has forever locked you into mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, and let's, let's put that into perspective um, for not just what you just said, but your um, whole experience because... We're celebrating 25 years in the West. Chicago was the first uh, location of KEPTA established. And then shortly after, a few years after of getting things rolling here, uh, the founder, Masanawa, then traveled to the New York area and began activities there. And so Nekitam Kamentu is a part of the first generation of, of students to, of initiates to come through the school and then not only come to the school, but then take responsibility for making sure that what they benefited could now be of benefit, be an opportunity to benefit other people in the New York area. Mm -hmm. And so since that time, you have been working within the Earth Center to make sure that this, this education uh, and opportunity is there for other people. Can you tell us how that has been? Because you're dealing with New Yorkers, so. How, 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 how you really want to open that, you, that, that can of worms? Yeah. Well, what I'm really trying to get at is how, because Kepta's mission is so big. Kepta's mission is so big, it has many sides. We even, you know, talked to um, uh, some representatives from Ancasta not too long ago. There's a publishing side, there's a, a side that does works um, uh, in, on the continent. But what really, as a nonprofit, is kept up bringing that benefits the communities that it's in, in the West? So we could speak about that in Chicago, but you haven't seen it come to New York, one of the biggest marketplaces of, you know, the West. <laughs> what, did, what did you really see? It, how, how it benefited other people, how, what kept you fighting in this, working in this, sacrificing to make sure that it can continue? It's a, it's a complicated situation. Uh, there, well, there's a couple levels. First of all, just uh, you know, in light of the history of Kemta, 
back then when I started the initiation, the, the movement was very small. Mm -hmm. It was a small movement here, you know, you, what are you talking about, 15 people that mm -hmm. were really active in it, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it was real grassroots, like real, you know, community oriented. Everybody was just working to keep everything afloat and continue and keep, keep, keep uh, the conduit the educational conduit open through our temples and centers between there and Medita, mm -hmm. or what we have in Burkina and Togo, and mm -hmm. here, wherever mm -hmm. we're located. Um, and, you know, as any community-based volunteer organization is, there's a huge learning curve, you know, mm -hmm. and there's only, only so much time you have, you know, and, and so we, uh, you know, we, everyone pushed for years, and, you know, we figured out better ways to do things you know we modified our approach obviously it's like man this really wasn't working we weren't doing it right let's try this way mm -hmm. that's not working let's do it this way i mean a lot of that happened over the years mm -hmm. and our time in new york was no exception mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. for that um we've come a long way you know we, we have membership all over the world now yeah. you know um but new york is an interesting place because we showed up when the Makaru established the temple there. It was the first time everybody was becoming aware of it. It was like 2006. Mm -hmm. um, and being an African organization, uh, it was uh, mostly on the radar of, of the black community in New York. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was that community. Mm -hmm. Now, coming in at 2006, you know, uh, for anybody who's aware about the black community in New York and when it comes to conscious things, Afrocentric things, when it comes to comedic things, there is already a huge pre-existing marketplace and oversaturation of things that resemble what we do, mm -hmm. you know. And so now in modern times, you know, that's the, the thing of our world in a modern way. We're satur saturated by choices and opportunities, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And when you have so many choices and you have so many opportunities and there's so many things out there, it's, uh, it's just like uh, uh, having a menu with a million plates on it and all mm -hmm. you want to do is eat. Mm -hmm. And then you look at it and you can't figure out what you want. And it's like you just get tired mm -hmm. from trying to choose what you have. It's mm -hmm. like a diner menu or something right. like that, you know. You ask the waiter for their recommendation. Yeah, just bring some. Just bring some because you're fatigued, and then you take anything. It might not be the right thing, <laughs> right? But us, uh, uh, you know, us, we actually uh, and the ironic is that the word ironic? The ironic part of it is we're we were actually the only organization of our kind in New York at that time. Meaning, coming from the temples, we come from mm -hmm. representing the 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 that l legacy of comedic culture, like the unbroken line of those right. temples, right. the grandeur of what's standing behind us on the continent. You know, I've been there; I saw it mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. You know, after my first year, I went. I was like, "Ooh, this is real." You know. Mm -hmm. So you're saying and, that's what made it unique in a saturation of things that look like it look like it but aren't that use some words like yeah i'm not trying to i'm not trying to uh, uh discredit or you know because oh. people have created a lot of things to help the community you right. know the right. best with whatever resources they had right you know with the best intentions and mm -hmm. everything in, mm -hmm. in mind so i'm not talking about about that but i'm talking about why our experience in new york mm -hmm. so us coming on the scene it's just like we were another juice at the gas station in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. You know, we were like a new fla kiwi flavor of Snapple or something like mm -hmm. that. You know, Snapple kiwi lemon. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like people already know what they want when they go to the juice store. Yeah, this is our was our situation in New York. Yeah, <laughs> so we, you know, you know, we 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 moved around. And we did a we did a lot of events. We did lectures. We hit the streets. We had the Sunny Side, the Fireflies, stuff like that. We went and we held in time classes for years and years and years, and it was good. We impacted some people's lives and uh, and had a positive influence in whatever way we could, mm -hmm. you know. But at a certain point, around two thousand seventeen, 
rent was too high. It was crazy. Mm. We just we weren't making enough money on tuitions and product sales to justify mm -hmm. renting a place in New York. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, we moved to New Jersey mm -hmm. uh, to a location in Newark, which mm -hmm. was much cheaper. You know, mm -hmm. it was like you get a whole house in Newark for which you get a small apartment for in New York, New York anywhere in any of the boroughs. Yeah. And uh, and at that time, we decided to uh, temporarily just close that branch of the New York temple and then open a New Jersey mm -hmm. temple mm -hmm. initiation. Mm -hmm. So. That's how the New Jersey Temple of Mutam started at that time. Uh, we had it rolling, and uh, and now, uh, after it got rolling, we then opened up uh, the New York Temple again, but mm. not in the city proper. Mm. We're no longer in the boroughs. We're about an hour and a half north of New York City mm -hmm. in Dutchess County, okay. between the town of Poughkeepsie and Rhinebeck. We're in a hamlet called Salt Point there, uh -huh. and uh, it's a beautiful location that we were able to establish. Mm -hmm. It's it's a rural location next to rivers and, and mountains and trees and everything that is conducive to actual spiritual activity. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a big jump and a big leap. So we, we just established that place up there, um, I think going on about a year and a half ago something like this now. We've had a number of events there, mm -hmm. but haven't begun our initiation uh, just yet. classes just yet, but we will soon. Okay. But but my our, to be honest, yeah, our experience in New York was, you would think people would be ecstatic about us existing, mm -hmm. but, you know, the state of the world, like, why should anybody know any better? Mm -hmm. The way the world goes, like, why would anybody have any more confidence in right. something else popping up being like, hey? No, that's the thing. When there's an oversaturation of things, then you don't trust anything. Mm -hmm. and it's just like, it's just, you know. I, I saw, and then you buy products. Yeah, that's that's yeah, the win of the, exactly. of the, society, of the con capitalist, exactly. consumerist thing. Exactly. <laughs> I, I see how things evolved in New York and it's really through the door of New York that you entered the organization but can you say a little more about how it was for you in New York in this small group that just started when Master Napa passed away because this was really like a vision coming from you know you, you even had a chance to study under Master Napa meet this man see how kind of intelligent this man was see how he was how he lived his life and then he passed away and now is this thing going to keep going because most of the things in this oversaturation culture that we've seen that look like this with movements the leader passes away in it oh I, it was incredible my time there uh, when i was taking the classes with him mm -hmm. it was incredible i mean it, it was like the best thing ever mm -hmm. it was like gold it was like striking gold you know i was just like i can't believe i found this <laughs> if you, you guys know? haven't already uh heard yet uh Nikita is the analogy king the analogy <laughs> master so just keep that in mind yes yes okay. no it was, it was it was amazing i mean i mean to the point where like all of the all of the kernels of wisdom and truths like thing i knew were truths but I didn't have like mm -hmm. context or were kind of disjointed and like kind of from here to there. Mm -hmm. Like just those first couple of weeks being there like moved everything into context. Mm -hmm. Like boom and it just came crashing down, pow, right mm -hmm. into the groove and like made sense. Like all the way from the root up to the fruits, you yeah. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is just incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, it was in incredibly nourishing. And that trend started, like, of course, like, listen, we were all young, man, when the master passed, when he transitioned. It was like, what are we going to do? But I would say the difference is this, because he, when he was alive, he would tell all of us again and again, when we would be too dependent on him and being like, what do we do, you know? Mm -hmm. How do we get through this and all that? He's like, look, he would be kind of stern. He'd be like, look, you guys you guys are going to be running this one day. I'm not going to be around to help you. So you mm -hmm. better like start using your brain, you know, mm -hmm. and stop being such a donkey, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like he was opposed to any kind of guru situation or anything like right. that. He would not that. Mm -hmm. But you have to learn from somebody who's good at something. 
you know, and he took that very seriously mm -hmm. as an initiate of his masters and as one being that kind of master who's also initiating masters. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying, yeah, you know, no, but, uh, but the fact is, is that it's leadership training. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. If it's not leadership training, then what the hell is it? A cult of personality? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. You know? So, you know, we couldn't, even though it was so difficult, somehow, traveling back and forth and uh, going through the process and then working with Naba Irita, mm -hmm. um, you know, and... Uh, all of that over the years, we were able to stabilize it and bring it forth and continue that quality, mm -hmm. you know, from before. Mm -hmm. and, and, and being able to adapt and be dynamic to a growing population of initiates, to interfacing with different groups of people, different crowds and stuff like that. It's, we were able to keep it going amazingly, but I, I had serious doubts that we were going to be, because I'm like, dang, like, what are we going to do? Like, I don't know if I'm not a donkey anymore. Like, you know? Well, the thing is, it's like you all had you on your side and against you at the same time, because mm -hmm. it's like when you look back at the history of the Earth Center and you see the people who are leading this organization, when you all took the helm, you were babies mm -hmm. in the big scheme of things. It's like... No one that I know at those ages would have been equipped to take leadership positions of an organization like this because of the, the magnitude, the scale, the profundity of it. It is just so much for to rest on the shoulders of, of young people. But that's actually what happened. And so the ups, the downs, the backs, the forth, how were you all able to withstand that given your youth, given... Uh, the growth that you're trying to achieve and the weight of the work. I think I developed some joint problems and graying hair. <laughs> like I had gray hair and joint problems that became overweight. A couple of you spells. Yeah. You're going to blame me. That's, that's how I managed it. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, but can you, because for our listeners, they're hearing that a person comes to a profound organization, even connected to the um, traditional modes of education, traditional hierarchies of society, and you come to an organization in 2006 that's kind of an organization sent out by those traditional ways that are very well established, very old, um, and this organization is representing them, and then now you have even worked your way to being responsible as an executive director in that. Uh, can you speak a little bit more for the for the listeners who are hearing? You know, you guys are connected to kings, to to temples, to traditional priesthoods. How could this kid from New Jersey become your executive director in just a few in just a, in just fifteen, sixteen years? Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's a not tough, to say it was that, a tough fifteen, sixteen years. Not to man. say that he's not qualified, but what I'm really looking for <laughs> is just just that how the organization really works between having its representatives here, but having its authority really home. You know, they say suffering teaches, right? Definitely, definitely. It's the, uh, best, it, it, it is the best teacher. Anyone who tells you like having a good time teaches it don't. Yeah. They don't yeah. like you got to struggle. It's like building muscles. You got to lift weight. Mm -hmm. I would never in a million years have imagined that I would be doing anything like what I was doing today, mm -hmm. like twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. But here I am doing it. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. um, nonetheless, uh, you know. Uh, obviously, we have a nonprofit that we manage here. And our nonprofit has divisions and departments. We have publication. We run our physical brick and mortar locations. You know, mm -hmm. for our temples, uh, we have uh, charitable projects. Um, all of these things require a business identity, and they require bylaws. Mm -hmm. You know, and they require some type of corporate structure that's breathable enough to interface with standing on the shoulders of traditional authorities and mm -hmm. all of this mm -hmm. and that's you know uh, you know apparently uh, through my years of being exposed to things I happen to be 
the okay person to be doing that. Not you know? okay. Don't, so, don't it at all. so, you know, I, 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 but the thing is, is that, you know, it's normal, you know, it's like, hey, what are we bringing in through our different divisions? You know, we have to check accounting, we have to pay rents and utilities, we have to do quality control in our institutions, either with the publications or with quality of what we're teaching in the initiations and so on and so forth. There's a lot of aspects involved. Mm -hmm. So the executive director becomes a, a, a coordinator of the heads of the divisions and stuff like that, just to make sure that everything is synchronized and I can be a conduit to kind of communicate and execute things mm -hmm. on the, on, on, for the benefit of everybody and coming from the benefit of coming from everybody's request. Mm -hmm. But it also, to me, it shows that you all grew up in this work. It was something that you saw and it benefited you in your life in such a profound way, it forced you to grow up, even maybe when you weren't ready to grow up or when you may not have grown up in the modern society. Being put in a position, it forced you to grow up and experience and see and navigate a world that you wouldn't have been able to do without. You. No one would be an executive director at, uh, let's say, Microsoft within a short time span. Mm -hmm. But we can see like the depth of this organization, even the levels of the organization, the temples in Medita, there's something that's so strong that's standing behind it, it allows you that opportunity to have that growth experience. Uh, it's like work, well, work on job tra training. Yeah. Kind of it's, it's very unique it, and it's hard to compare to a corporation. Yeah, you couldn't bring somebody, you couldn't say like, hey, let me go, uh, Hire Ed from this company. Exactly. Come over and be our executive exactly. director. If you have no experience in the traditions or anything like that, it, it would it, not it, work. It ain't gonna work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You'd have a heart attack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, it's so interesting that aspect of um, an organization that serves as the representative or the face or the extension of a very old indigenous systems and culture. Be, and even, you know, you serving as the executive director and ensuring that things functioning together to be that representative on this side is bringing a big, a big opportunity to people in the West because now even KEPTA is, is releasing like annual divinations. Now even sure. KEPTA is, you know, making more and more of the uh, value of the culture um, accessible to people over here in the West who are really still in that cacophony of oversaturation yeah. in the West, but there's these these tenets of culture that have been guiding the members of that culture through eras for millennia, and now more and more of those things are becoming available through you know that hard work of those those children that have grown up in this to become adults. Sure, we're, we're, we're um, working to bring it to a wide variety of people and populations. You know, you have different ethnicity, different socioeconomic classes, different geographical locations. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the tightrope walks that we've had to do is really make, translate the tangible, beneficial resources that we offer mm -hmm. in, into kind of simple language. Mm -hmm. and and simple tools, the things that people can acquire, you know, either either if it's like a wisdom that we're sharing or uh, marketing the initiation classes or products or something like this, that challenge has really been in being able to translate that into such a practical and basic language that people, that it'll click with people that are actually looking for that thing. Because mm -hmm. that's where you miss it. Mm -hmm. It's like if you get too verbose, if you're talking too much about something, get too philosophical or too this way or that, yes. it's like that moment where a person is actually looking for that thing and that thing comes to meet them, it just goes like mm -hmm. round like mm -hmm. that because it's not clear, it doesn't clear. click and they don't recognize and say, oh, that's what that is, mm -hmm. you know. So that's been like one of the, the more challenging things, but we've been, we've been doing it, you know. Mm -hmm. We still have a long way to go. A lot of it just has to do with the collective consciousness of modern society, you know, kind of, mm -hmm. and, and all of this and our own experience, you know, but our, our uh, 
the direction we're going in and our goals and our visions, like uh, uh, we certainly have a long way to go, but I, I, I think if we continue on that trend of trying to translate it and keep it practical and keep it beneficial for everybody, we're gonna, we gonna get there mm -hmm. in the best way, whatever reality dictates. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what, can you say a little bit more about, because up until now we've, we've been talking a lot about what the organization's work brings to people on this side, the benefit that is gained on this side of the ocean. But back um, in Merita, in the villages, in the areas where this is coming from, where this has been preserved, what is the organization here doing for over there in the last 15, 25 years that you've seen evolve over time? Oh, gosh. It's almost... Uh, let me try to put it in simple language. First, what we've done is we've been able to preserve temples. We've done some, that's the basic stuff. We've done some water wells and like actually preserving structures. Mm -hmm. But the real substantial thing I think that we've done is, is because of the interest of all of the people coming from the West and traveling there mm -hmm. to benefit from a culture, normally something that most people, even locals, start to call savage, you know, as, as new, you know, this is antiquated, this is savage. You know, whether it's religious colonialism locally that's moving the people away, or economic opportunities abroad that's sending the youth away and stuff like this. Um, us doing what we have done uh, shows uh, locally to the youth that there is something of great value where they are, mm -hmm. you know, to stand on. Mm -hmm. And it also has awakened a great sense of pride in Pan-Africanists who have been fighting for that there, a lot of the old guard and new guard, mm -hmm. and people wanting to really do something for the land there and preserve the traditions, and the traditionalists as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have uh, uh, Head Eye, Head Eye Shot Healing Center in Togo. We also have in, uh, work, do work in Boba de Olasso and in Ouagadougou, the temple there, mm -hmm. and in, in those communities, you know, um, uh, like for example, the Head Eye Shot Healing Center, that place that we established became a place of the traditions, mm -hmm. including the Tem House mm -hmm. in Sokade proper. Mm -hmm. So in a city that was kind of apparently, I, I, I didn't say it, like losing itself, mm -hmm. uh, it became kind of a beacon of light and a representation of the tradition and all of the healers and all of the youth kind of standing with that kind of know it's a place to come together and unite and it's kind of reawakened a spark that's bringing people back close to the roots mm -hmm. instead of losing it. Yeah. So that's been huge. Mm -hmm. And that exists. And then we also have a lot of other people. We have uh, other initiates that have actually come from different parts of Africa or Medita, uh, different tra traditions who have seen it and that wakens it up in them. So not only have we done brick and mortar things, but we've also enhanced like this kind of collective pride mm -hmm. Uh, towards preserving these things. We also have farming projects. I mean, you just talk about a, a couple of wells we've built, you know, structures that we preserve, building the Hedaisha Healing Center as a hub for traditionalists and for people locally and also from abroad to come to experience ceremonies and stuff like this. Um, we can talk about that. We can talk about the farming project, the, the seed bank, the Kim Youth Center, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, um, also the... Uh, children's education fund stuff like that you know? mm -hmm. well yeah. I, I won't force you to do all of that yeah i mean there's a lot of have there's a, a lot of stuff we've worked on you know um we can have the head of the division on for you know yeah, yeah talk to them about that yeah. no no worries no worries. <laughs> So it's very interesting. We talked about the youth kind of spearheading uh, this movement after the transition of the founder. And you all... I mean, we, even the founder, you know, started this pretty young. Yes. Like Kepra, he was in his 20s. And then it took him around the world, you know, uh, through investigating, through continuing the research to build it. He crossed the Sahara four times. Mm -hmm. He went to Germany and investigated what had been taken out in the museums in Europe, you know, translated some things, got in trouble for being able to read and translate the Medu, and then came back and then came here to get started. 
and really like his late 30s. 30. So mm -hmm. he was young too. A lot of people don't realize yeah. that because he was walking around. You think this guy's like 150 the way he <laughs> talks, but he was young too. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And so with that being said, the foundation having that that youth. The youth. Mm -hmm. Having the foundation being so youthful, being able to then take it to the next level because with the transition of the founder, the organization has grown leaps and bounds. How, mm -hmm. how many locations are there now? Uh, currently, uh, we in, in the U.S., we have uh, a temple location in New York. Uh, we have a initiation class location in D.C. We have a location in Houston. We have a Texas. We have a location in Chicago, Illinois. Um, soon to be in the Bay Area, possibly. And then we have uh, uh, two locations in Canada, two in the United Kingdom, and of course our locations in uh, in Merita. Uh, mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, if you all would like to learn more about those locations, please visit our website at www.theearthcenter.org and you can find out more information how to reach us in any of those locations that are hopefully near you. Um, we also have like an online program as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's you can sign up for initiation classes online. If you're not close to one of our physical locations, you can do that. Well, it's beautiful to see that the organization is growing and uh, by leaps and bounds, we can see the local growth the local growth as well as the online growth uh, that's happening. And we appreciate you, uh, Executive Director, for coming and spending some time with us and sharing with our audience to give them some a little more perspective about uh, the KEPTOP organization and what we're doing and how we can benefit you and your local community as well. Thank you for coming you for on coming. and celebrating with us 25 years now. Uh, you got it. My pleasure. It's an honor. Well, I'm back. I know you miss me. Uh, that's a great interview, you know. We're back. No, it's always great to sit down with uh, Nikitam. Nikitam is uh, an, an extremely funny person, uh, extremely intelligent brother. It was great to have him on. Yeah, he's funny, but, you know, he's he's one of the most committed brothers, you know, that we have uh, fighting for this mission. And it's, uh, it's great to have him on and talk about his experience and, uh, you know, what he's been through in this mission because, um, you know, you don't, like they were saying, you don't get to just wake up and be executive director of an uh, organization like this. It's because uh, he's put in the work, he's been dedicated, and, you know, it's about uh, the mission is is something serious, so you put it in the hands of serious people. So, you know, don't let the jokes fool you. He's a, he's a very serious dude. You, get, you catch that side of him, oof. You don't want to get no, that. definitely, yeah. definitely, <laughs> and uh, we don't need you talking about it, of all people. But um, no, I mean, even Masanaba was one of the funniest people you'll meet. But that's Absolutely. one side of him. Mm -hmm. Another side of him is one of the most serious people you'll meet. And mm -hmm. Nekitim is definitely when we're talking about a spiritual path and a spiritual life. I think the best word is devoted. He's mm -hmm. one of the most devoted brothers to his own evolution and to this mission, um, and to his, you know. To, to his heritage and, and uncovering his heritage. He's also uh, lives in uh, Merita now with us in Bobo Julasso, uh, in pretty much the same neighborhood. So his devotion mm -hmm. speaks for itself. No, I basically live in his backyard, you know. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. You live down the street. Right. Well, you go out of your back, his back door and I'm like three houses down. Yes, yes. Um, but he brought up some Oh, real, real quick, before we get into talking about the interview, I just wanted to mention that, you know, because you mentioned that you've been devoted to his own evolution and he's been devoted to the mission. Uh, <clears throat> and I just wanted to say for our listeners and especially those who may be parts of the organization or follow the organization that the two go hand in hand, you know, because the mission in the organization is what's giving you what you need. So your devotion to the organization that's giving you what you need is also going to benefit you because then you make sure that you keep getting what you need. And I think that really ties right back into um, the two of us. I mean, you know, when Naki Tim and uh, Nehez, as they were talking about in the conversation, uh, putting in the work, you know, I was right there. And uh, I've, I've been right there through through that transition period of my career passing away. 
and um, it really took me back uh, listening to the interview through all that history and um, I just remember when uh, he had been ill for some time and I, I I don't know if you remember, I came and asked you, I was like, well, what if he doesn't make it? He was like, well, we keep going. And I was like, but, you know, <laughs> as long as my big bro over here is ready to keep going, I'm ready. You know, so we've been doing it ever since. I mean, you know. I mean the thing is, you, you mentioned, you know, you coming to me at that time and what what I said. Masanaba let us know when he was here, he's not going to be here. Mm -hmm. He used to tell us all the time because not a lot of people were coming to his lectures, not a lot of people were coming to his classes. Maybe at the beginning they were. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in Chicago, like you pointed out, got really held something against him because he taught everybody. Uh, they wanted him to just teach black people. He taught everybody. He enjoyed everybody. He befriended everybody. Mm -hmm. He even married people outside of his race. Everybody started having problems, whatever problems they could find with him. And so there wasn't a lot of people at our events. And he used to tell us, don't worry about that. Uh, one day I will be gone and they will be looking for me with a flashlight in the daytime trying to find me, wishing they didn't miss the opportunity to see me. And then they will have you guys here that they find and they will have to know me through you and he told us that again and again and at that time sometimes he would say it and he would be like because there will be a time I will go back home and then I won't be accessible to everybody just a few of you and we were thinking okay yeah that would be great you'll be in the village we'll get to come and see you in the village no problem for us as long as it's me you're talking about I, I still get access right mm -hmm. and we were thinking of it like that none of us really knew he was talking about going back to the real home going you know his ancestors. passing and going back to his ancestors that yeah. sent him on this mission but look even for him to say something like that you know that i think one of the problems that other or institutions people had with him is that like he will say something like that that will make you know that you know the other people who are out here teaching things that look like what we're teaching they don't have the same level of knowledge and he refused to kind of like just give the credit to other people who you know may have known some things but didn't have the experience and the knowledge that he had or the background that he had or the connection that he had to traditional spirituality yes um, but it should be yeah. that point should be well stated because it wasn't like a judgmental thing that he had for others right but it was like a, it's only in america you find people who think they can invent themselves mm -hmm. they can take a training read a book and then claim they're a priest take a training read a book and then claim they're a spiritual guide because he knew he had went through initiation he had initiated others he had crossed the Sahara Desert four times, educating himself, teaching others. He had went through the Sahara, uh, doing initiations for the Tuareg people. He had, you know, went deep into the traditions, into some of the secret sites, sacred sites that people don't know about, and you know, studying the the, the resources that the traditions have kept. Mm -hmm. He knows all of the things he had been through, and then now he comes to America. And back home, you know, he had people deep in the traditions who were begging him, let me just go and be your bodyguard. Let me, you know, just assist you in this way. And he knows that this is his mission. This is what he has to carry out. He knows back home he can spit because he used to chew tobacco. He can spit and somebody can grab it up in the dirt, make mud with it and eat it because he's just that well respected back home for his experiences and the knowledge he has. And then to come here and to find children sitting in front of him who have only read books and they're trying to talk to him like, hey, you know, you should really understand what I know. And he's just, and he can see through them. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, what do you, what do you, you know? But he was respectful, but it was just like, you guys really don't get it over here. With a loss of culture and a loss of the institutions that, that initiate people, you guys have this kind of freedom that's killing you where you guys will claim to be masters of something you know you didn't earn you know you didn't experience it mm -hmm. i've been around the world i've been called to temples around the planet please 
can you come and fix the issue we having with our divinities because we don't know how to fix it we lost our divinity and ran away from the temples can you fix it for us and he knows that he'd been through all of that and he'd been solving people's problems around the world spiritual cultures and then he comes here and has to listen to people who barely been out of their house they've just been reading books they haven't seen anything and then they want to be respected on the same level as him. And in a culture like this, a culture of freedom and democracy and all of that, all of that's okay. All of that's doable. I mean, <clears throat> I just talked to a brother, because <clears throat> we just did this episode on Kwanzaa. I just talked to a brother today who uh, we were talking about the fact that Kwanzaa is a made-up holiday. And he was like, all holidays are made up. Mm. And, that's the thing. you know... When you don't know, you just don't know. But at least when you don't know, at least know that you don't know and don't feel like you know. But that's the thing. When you don't know, you suffer. Yeah. You, that you, you don't know that you don't know. And that's what brings on the suffering. Yeah. So, you know, at least uh, we at least have the opportunity to stand and uh, speak for uh, or on behalf of or in support of something that we don't know everything about. We're not necessarily the experts. We're not necessarily the gurus and whatever, but we at least can be some children trying to learn and trying to pick some things up that our forefathers once were caring, and uh, we can speak on behalf of that. Well, and let's be clear. We can at least be some children to point the way to mm -hmm. what still exists. Mm -hmm. If I'm a child that runs out to you and says, hey, my grandpa is still alive over there, then you have to respect that child because he pointed you to the one that has knowledge. Mm -hmm. And now with children, maybe we're not so much children anymore. Casabes talking about how old he is every episode, but we have I still children. Feel like a child. We have children, and we even though we have children, we know we're still young, and we come from a place that's extremely young. Mm -hmm. We come from a place that even gave up on its heritage, so that adds to its youth. But in our experiences and our education and our initiations, we know enough to say, hey. There's still that elder living over there. If you really want to learn, you go. You go learn from him. Mm -hmm. We're not claiming to be the person that you know has it all. We claiming to say, hey, those temples are still there and they've been there for a long time. They can tell you and teach you much more than any person over here can teach you because none of us are standing on that kind of heritage. I'll be back over there as soon as I get the chance. Like uh, our founder used to say, he used to correct us in the West because in the West we have the saying. What you don't know can't hurt you. But what you know is exactly what can hurt you. If you what don't you know, don't you know. suffer. Mm. What you don't know is exactly what will be the thing to hurt you. The bullet that will kill you is the one you don't see coming. So with that, we want to wish everybody the courage, the strength to keep fighting, to investigate and growing what, what you know and you know, uh, overcoming what you don't know because the one that knows knows and the one that doesn't know, they suffer. So, uh, before you uh, sign off, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. Make sure you put a comment or question, uh, any feedback that you have about this episode. Even if you disagree with something we're saying, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, we'll, if you have a comment, then we'll talk about it next time if it's a question or it's something uh, addressing the topic and subject matter. Uh, we're also excited for our next series that we have, Getting Ready to Start. Um, after this episode, we'll be getting into community solid solidarity, resilience, and uh, movements to fight back against the attacks on us as human beings, as a human race. And let us close this episode in celebration of 25 years of the mission by wishing for the gratitude and the wealth, spiritual wealth, to be paid to the spirit of our master in the world of the dead for the sacrifices and the hard work that he put in to bring this mission uh, out of the secrecy of the comedic traditions and to the world stage. Okay. Life can be so sweet on the sunny side of the street.